The title of this series sounded to me a bit like a detective novel, a case for optimism. <laughs> so let's do some sleuthing and fact-finding, shall we? Let's see what we've been brushing onto the carpet. Deforestation and habitat loss. Look behind the door. Greenhouse gases. Search the garden outside. Contamination of water sources. Let's widen our search a bit, shall we? Melting glaciers. Sea level rise. Plastics choking our oceans. Biodiversity collapse. Chemicals in our soil. Poison on our plates. And the greatest menace of all, climate change. The facts unwind like a rattle of doom, like the drum roll of a death march. But we turn a deaf ear and carry on our usual ways anyway. We will take that Uber ride because it's too darn hot to cycle. We will chase that big American dream and jet from continent to continent, busy and important in our business suits and shiny limousines. Because who's got the time to look back and count carbon footprints? And even if you're just a nobody, even then you don't care when you ask for a plastic bag to carry home a plastic bottle of carbonated drink. The way we treat our planet is no case for optimism. So what then? Shall we just give up and go home? Shall we just accept that there is no hope and resign to the fact that there is no future? Is there nothing we can do to make the world a better place for our children? Is there really no room for optimism when it comes to saving our planet? Well, if my experiences as a wildlife filmmaker are anything to go by, then I tell you this. Despite the evidence pointing at absolute doom, conservation today is still very much a case for optimism. I will explain, but before that, let's just rewind a little bit. I just told you that I'm a wildlife filmmaker. Now that itself is quite the case for optimism. I come from a country which is obsessed with its youth, being doctors and engineers and lawyers. And in that very serious mix, my career looks a bit like this. Add to that, I'm a woman. When I tell people that I've made a profession out of exploring jungles in pursuit of wild animals, that I'm busy chasing my dreams instead of settling down into a comfortable career and a marriage like society expects me to, then I have to say a lot of people struggle very hard to reserve their judgments. A lot of the times there's encouragement. Sometimes it's amazement. Other times it's bewilderment. Sometimes a bit of discomfort, subtle disapproval even. But to be fair, most of the times it's just good old fashioned avuncular concern for my health, safety, sanity, future and everything in between. But you see, this is a career I fought very hard to have. And no amount of social skepticism has or ever will change my mind. Right after university, I had to choose between following the herd and following my heart. The former would give me all the guarantees of a straight and narrow life. The latter, a life dedicated to nature and to animals a passion that goes back all the way to childhood. So with a great deal of youthful optimism, I took a leap of faith. Has it been easy? Nope. Leave alone the challenges of the job itself, of the nature of the work, of actually working out in the wild, in the jungle, in extreme conditions. Leave alone those challenges. India barely even has a wildlife filmmaking industry. And no matter how much you love what you do, when you have to live from assignment to assignment, your confidence can take a real proper beating. Along the way, I have to admit that my optimism van took some severe swerves. 
there were times I'd panic and think that perhaps when I was at that crossroad, I should have just chosen the safer option. But then I would have never woken up in a jungle camp somewhere ready to devote my life to conservation. I wouldn't have seen the wonders of nature as I have seen. So even though at times it's felt like the road is leading nowhere, I have seen places and smelt the morning dew in deep forests and listened and woken to the music of birds in the mountains and heard the thunder of a lion's roar right outside my tent and seen the breathtaking silence of the seas on untouched islands. And somewhere along the way, somehow, I've even earned a few international accolades for the films that I've made, including a green Oscar becoming India's youngest woman to do so, apparently. A case for optimism. But I've needed optimism for more than just my personal ambitions. Sometimes I've needed optimism just to carry on. Because this dream job at times has felt more like a nightmare. For every magical experience that I've had out in nature, for every amazing animal that I've filmed, for every spectacular place that I have seen, I have also witnessed the horrific slaughter of nature. Our earth is being ravaged. No place, no animal is being spared. Our greed and negligence is pushing the planet to the very brink. And if I have seen the very best of what nature has to offer, I have also seen the worst of what human beings can do. An incident that stands out happened a few years ago in the Andaman Islands. I was there to shoot for a documentary for Animal Planet and for a sequence I had to dive in the coral reefs. And I had always been a swimmer, but I had never dived before. So this was a hugely exciting opportunity for me. I was bursting with excitement and I just couldn't wait. So after three days of rigorous training, I was finally ready for my first dive ever. This was going to be the magical world of Nemo and Dory, exploding with colors and textures and all kinds of weird alien creatures. But when I went underwater, what I saw was the very opposite. What I saw instead was an endless stretch of ghostly white corals, completely bleached and lifeless. This was no magical world of clownfish and clams. I had dived in a graveyard, in a cemetery created by rising sea temperatures caused by man-made climate change and I could have cried. My first ever dive in life put a face to a problem that was so far just a notion, climate change. And indeed, half of the world's coral reefs today are dying. And when you see that firsthand, when you experience something that heartbreaking firsthand, how do you hold on to optimism? Well, I wish my friend Muhammad was here to answer that question for you. Muhammad is a forest guard in the Andamans. He quit a perfectly lucrative career in mechanical engineering to dedicate his life to the paradise he grew up in. Muhammad has seen his beloved reefs go from rainbow colored to pale white in the matter of months. He has seen the plastic filled bodies of endangered animals wash up on these pristine shores. Yet, Muhammad gets up, gets dressed every morning to go fight what most people would consider a losing battle. He cleans the beaches of plastic. He monitors and participates in coral restorations. He protects the eggs and hatchlings of endangered species. It's a long shot that Muhammad alone can save his patch of paradise, but nothing stops him from trying a case for optimism. And that's what it's all about. 
Around the world, hundreds of people are fighting tooth and nail to protect their patch of green. Fighting to protect one habitat, one forest, one wetland, one species, one animal, sometimes just even one tree. These are the optimists that are keeping our planet alive one battle at a time. Across the world from the Andamans, I once made a film on a rare and extraordinary species called the Kakapo. It's a delightful, fat, flightless parrot that looks more like a teddy bear. Meet His Excellency. Not human, but parrot. Sirocco is a very rare bird, a kakapo. And there were just 125 of them when I was filming them. But wait, that's actually a good thing. Because in the 70s, there were just 18 kakapo left. They were hunted to the point of near extinction. But a few optimistic individuals decided to take those remaining 18 and put them on a safe island to give the species a second chance. Despite death, disease, infertility, and a run of all kinds of bad luck, the Kakapo recovery team never gave up on the Kakapo because losing the birds was simply not an option, a case for optimism. Closer to home in the Sundarbans, the world's largest mangrove expanse, there is a species that is even more rare. And no, it's not the tiger. It's a terrapin called the Batagurbaska. It's a kind of turtle. And there are so few of them left in the world today that they're actually considered extinct in the wild. There are just 50 Batagurbaska left today and they're all in captivity. While filming for Round Glass Sustain, I came across Dr. Shailendra Singh. He's battling to give the species another chance in the wild. He's tagging them and releasing pairs into the wild in hope that they will breed and someday perhaps make a comeback. But you think, what good will that do? You ask, what's the point really of trying to bring back a turtle that is as good as extinct? Good question, because optimism is contagious. If one man's optimism can bring back a species from nearly going extinct, imagine the hope that will give the hundreds of other people out there fighting for the thousands of other species that are heading just the same way. Optimism can and does catch on. Did you know that in my backyard, right here in the jungles of South Bengal, there is an annual wildlife hunting tradition Thousands of people come out on special days of the year flaunting a frightening variety of weapons. Together, this mob descends on quiet forests with blood-curdling screams and drunken joy and wanton slaughter follows. Not a single living thing is spared. Birds, mammals, reptiles, they kill them all and they call this sport a tradition. And it happens year after year after year, despite the fact that it's actually banned by the government. It's against the law and yet it just carries on. Because of course, politicians need their votes from these people and they won't do very much to stop it. But that's okay. Because meet Meghna, Shuvrajuti, Tiyasha and the rest of the gang. They belong to an NGO called HEAL, a small group of obsessed and dedicated volunteers determined to save, protect and preserve wildlife. Even if it means standing up alone in front of a mob of drunken armed men, refusing to let them go on the illegal hunt. A fierce case of optimism. And there we have it. Hundreds of such stories being told from all over the world. These people determined to fight for their patch of green.
despite the odds being stacked against them right from the start. Some, like Greta Thunberg, choose a stage that commands a global reach. They speak in confident voices and inspire a generation to join a movement. But for every Greta out there, there are thousands of individuals quietly going about their own battles in their own backyards. And that's what it takes for a case for optimism. Because if each and every patch of this planet had an optimist looking after it, protecting it, fighting for it, then that's what it takes to look after planet Earth. So let's not overthink this. Let's just, all of us, do our bit, our share, exactly where we are. And together, we can make a great case for optimism.